Praise the Lord. We're going to read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, 12 to 18. <clears throat> and it says, So then death work in, worketh in us, but life in you, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written. I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Praise the Lord. So let's read again verse number 12. So then death worketh in us, worketh in us, but life in you. The Apostle Paul gives the Corinthians the knowledge that because they were dedicated to ministry at that time, a time when the gospel was first pre, uh, being spread and preached around the Gentile world, it was like a door that was opening, that at that time it was an extremely dangerous time, moment of time for them to do so because the quote-unquote powers that be, the spiritual powers that be, uh, gave them a whole lot of trouble, risk, risking their life. But for them, or their preaching as they had, had provided it to the Corinthians, was giving them spiritual life. Lives that could be enlivened in God, strengthened according to the Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit, receiving forgiveness of sins. The Apostle Paul had mentioned the wide difference there was between those who ministered at that time and those who had received the blessings and benefits of that preaching. Though for them too, it strengthened them spiritually, one could say, to provide to others of the gospel and the truth. But the part that he mentions is death working in them, meaning that there was always a threat to their lives because of what they preached. That alluded to that threat that was placed upon the life of their lives, the ministers' lives, as they minister the truth of the gospel and that which the enemy Satan tried to inflict and threaten them with. Yet, who was the benefact? Who were the benefactors of their battles with the enemy? The Corinthians and also all the other churches and people that had received the word of God. And so they had ministered to the Corinthians and so they were benefactors, and uh, of course, uh, many other churches were, and we are today because we have these letters also from Paul, the Apostle Paul. And so it, it, it illuminates the struggles that he had faced and had given to them and to us today a lot of insight into the word of God. And so um, there were uh, uh, an abundance, we could say, of spiritual uh, battles going on because they had received, because of the gospel message. It was a door being opened and the enemy didn't want that door to be opened, tried to keep that door closed. But that door was opened and the Corinthians received the word of God. And they received it with, I one could say, joy because they had their lives changed. They repented. They followed the apostolic doctrine. And they had been baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Spirit. And so then 
there were many other messages too that probably gave them uh, no doubt gave them uh, much spiritual insight even to the point of these two letters being written for our learning as well and on into eternity as God's word gives to give it had, had been given to them and produced for our benefit just as well in verse number 13 it says we having the same spirit of faith According as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Because the Apostle Paul and others who were ministers of the faith in Christ Jesus had spoken to them, what had come out of it was this fact. They had the same spirit of faith, which faith, according to Jesus, can move mountains. And of that faith that had brought the Holy Spirit into their lives and holiness as their goal. One thing is certain, the faith that they had in Christ Jesus brought not only in the Apostle Paul and others to repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, but they also had received the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And because of their belief, their faith, their obedience to that that faith of the apostles' doctrine, they speak of it, they preach of it, that it is faith in Jesus. And in obedience to the apostles' doctrine, no doubt, hallelujah, is a wonderful thing because it brought salvation to them. It is the gospel message. The apostles' doctrine is the gospel message. For them to speak of it, it is other, utterly important. For it is for their salvation to people to have the salvation of many other people. He had spoken to them and brought to them the faith in Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Gloria a Dios. To Jesus, which for them was a way to get them on the pathway to eternal life. To speak of the gospel message and, the, and of the faith in Jesus is so utterly important. To speak what's necessary to transfer the message from what is inside a person, one who has it, one who has obeyed it, one who is a witness of Jesus, to transfer that message to another person so that that seed can be planted in them and it can grow and produce fruit. For the apostles, they took it upon themselves that that was their ultimate goal, to speak and preach Jesus and the apostles' doctrine. That is, apostles in a plural. It is not only their belief in Jesus and the apostles' doctrine, but it is also the belief in Jesus and the preaching of the apostles' doctrine as a necessity. Verse 14 says, Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up also up us, up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Here is the good news of believing, having faith in Jesus and obedience to the apostles' doctrine. The fact that God will raise up the ones who have believed in Jesus and obeyed the apostles' doctrine. This raising up of the church will happen because God will bring it to pass. And when raised up, there will be a presentation of the church as a whole and the ministers, including the founder before Jesus. The presentation of such a church will be before Jesus Christ at the throne in heaven. Who will do this? God will raise up the church and its ministers, and that is not all, but the presentation of such a church will be in front of Jesus Christ on the throne together. For here it is stated that the presentation of such people, um, the church folks, will be together as a group with their ministers facing Jesus Christ together. No doubt the judgment will begin of the ones within the church and what they have done for Jesus Christ. Of course, any bad works will be admonished, no doubt, but rewards will be 
for those who have done that which is good, and it will be provided. That's the good news. And of course, Jesus Christ is our uh, advocate. The presentation of the church and its leaders will be for the glory of God and not for the glory of mankind. But they will all be rewarded for what they've done in Christ Jesus. In verse 15 it says, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Here it seems there's so mu there's so much at stake. The reason for the preaching of the gospel and that of the apostolic doctrine, holiness, and so on is, as he stated, for them so that they abound and are blessed. In reality, it was not only just for the Corinthians back then, for the letters to the Corinthians are also in the hands for our usage. Or another way to say it, our perusal, our use. Amen. Praise God. So we today can use it. Hallelujah. And it's all for the glory of God. Praise the Lord. Therefore, the entire ministry is for the church body. Two. As the Apostle Paul had written to the Ephesians, be abundant. Hallelujah. The abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Having that grace continue on in its growth. Hallelujah. Abundant grace, meaning for people that have sinned, and even sinned uh, very, very profoundly. That uh, grace is abounds much more when it is needed. And it can be abundant for any sins that people have committed. It's abundant grace forgiven for people. Not, it doesn't matter what part of the world one is from, what position, what standing, low or high placed people, what race, it makes no difference. There is an abundance of grace. So people can find themselves in Jesus Christ. Uh, just they have to believe, have faith in Jesus and obey the apostolic doctrine. And they can be blessed with an abundance of of grace hallelujah and that comes from the throne of grace Jesus Christ he loves to give his grace to people because it is his blood that he had shed for them so that they can receive his mercy come into the faith and receive exactly what they need in God all of this is for the plan of God to be realized in the life and that will give abundant and overflowing glory to God that people have come into the faith. In verse number 16, it says, For which cause we faint not, but, through, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Many may only be concerned about the outward man, in its appearance, uh, putting on good, wonderful, handsome, or beautiful clothes and decorating like they decorate the Christmas tree. They like to decorate the uh, body. However, the church is to condition itself to worry more about the inward man, but yet at the same time to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And why do I mention such things? Well, Romans 12, 1 to 2 talks about presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, a sacrifice for us 
to give to God what he wishes. And uh, that is uh, talking about our bodies. So that is the outward man, not just the inward man, but it's the outward man. As it states Roman 12, uh, 12, 1 to 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. So, therefore, it means that it is our choice how we present our body. And then we follow God's guidelines in his word concerning how to present our bodies. Acceptable unto God into this world not acceptable to the world <laughs> but acceptable to god which is like very contrary the world likes its ways but god likes its ways which is much different that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto god which is your reasonable service is not a difficult thing it's actually, in the eyes of God, is very reasonable. And be not conformed to this world in the acceptance of the worldly presentation of their bodies, but the godly presentation of our bodies. But be ye transformed by the renewing of, of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, obviously, our mind is the one that makes the decision whether or not to follow um, holiness according to our outward man or uh, just to follow the world. But following the world is, and its uh, presentation of their bodies is not the same as uh, that which is reasonable to God. So what is acceptable, good, and perfect, and will of God is different from and opposite from the world presentation. Hallelujah. But when one gets into the spirit of God and, and begins to have the spirit of God flow, one begins to realize there are things that maybe I should get rid of and sacrifice for the purpose of having a bodily presentation before God and even outside in the world as a living sacrifice, a sacrifice that continues on in my life that I decided to get rid of because I wanted God to be pleased, not the world to be pleased. The world has a different idea concerning holiness. And so when people come to God, they're, they should, uh, you know, give up some things. It is true, as was commented to me in a book about holiness by pastor names, Huston in Pennsylvania, that the body is the outside. Uh, we, we all know that, but, and that is what people can view like houses. So he's, he was comparing the outside of the body, like the outside of a house. And I thought that was a very interesting comparison. So the outside of the house, people see that, but they can't really see the inside unless they're invited in. And so they look on the outside and if the outside is good, maybe they kind of think, well, the inside must be good too. But that's the only thing that the people on the outside of the house can see is basically the outside of the house. Except if it has a big window, then you can see part of the inside of the house. Thus, if the outside looks good or right, then the out inside, in the mind of the people, maybe it looks good too. But in any, any case, Romans 12, 1 to 2 shows that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. So it can be presented unto God in, in, in what is acceptable to him so that when the world does see our presentation, of course, they might be thinking that we are a little bit strange in this world. But we are showing them a model of true Christianity. So Paul said, they fainted not, but they kept on in their preaching and teaching the word of God. And also, of course, we could say with their presentation of their bodies in a wholly acceptable uh, manner, 
not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The idea is to be presented to God once we leave this body and go into the next world, uh, that G uh, God will see us and be accept and we will be accepted. Hallelujah. So we ha should be acceptable unto him now so that when that day comes, we'll also be accepted. And then he talked about the inward man. The inward man is renewed day by day. So I got to thinking about this to renew our inward man day by day. And it says here, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. It is, okay, how? <laughs> well, uh, I would think that the inward man needs to, to have that refreshing of the Spirit of God. So uh, how does that come about? It comes about by praying to God and having God's Spirit move in our life so that, yes, our inward man is renewed. Hallelujah. And so it has to take a, a sacrifice on our part, I think. For King Solomon of Israel it is thus written of him in 1 Kings 4.29, and I like this very, very much. And it says, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding, exceeding much in largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. Of course, I've been reading the Bible, you know, since childhood and reading it uh, many times. And this, I read this and I was like, really? There's something here that really gives me, gave me uh, an insight a little bit more. And the fact is, the KJV put it uh, very, uh, very well here. Because it's not just talking about wisdom and understanding, but also largeness of heart. Whereas some other versions don't even talk about the largeness of heart. They just talk about the wisdom and understanding. So, hey, that's why we like King James. I mean, the part where I read it and it says largeness of heart, I said, whoa. And Solomon had not only wisdom and understanding, but largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. Now, you can't count that. It's like an abundance. In abundance so much. And that was talking about his heart. And we could also say his wisdom and understanding was the same, just like the sand that is on the seashore. Wow. I mean, that's a lot. He could dig and dig and dig and still have many, uh, a lot, much more yet to come. And that was talking about the inward man, largeness of heart and the wisdom and understanding that was in the inward man. So he was, because he prayed to God, and of course, wisdom and understanding, true wisdom, the best wisdom, comes from God. The largeness of heart also can come from God. So what is stated is that he had a largeness of heart. The wisdom, understanding, a large of, largeness of heart was like that of, as it states, the sand that is on the seashore. How can it be compared to the sand that is on the seashore? That is the question. What made the writer here compare it to the sand of the seashore? The wisdom, understanding, and largeness of the heart was in so much that it could not be counted. That is, one could say, looking at the heart of Jesus, the wisdom and understanding of Jesus, so profound, so deep, so loving, so kind, so wonderful, the heart of Jesus. When the Bible refers to wisdom and understanding, yes, it comes to, from God. King Solomon had an abundance given unto him. It can say, it can be said indubitably that there was so much regarding Solomon's heart. His heart could be compared to the heart of Jesus Christ in that aspect, largeness of heart. Until he started following other gods, I would say. 
For it was truly something that showed the love of God without question. One of the things that may not be seen within the life of King Solomon was his largeness of heart. We talk about his wisdom, his understanding, but largeness of heart, it's like, really? But it was there, it says in the word. Furthermore, what is something that is not shown in many other ver versions, I've already said this, but I'll say it again, is the fact of this largeness of heart. It looks like it was t almost taken out, almost like the time that he turned to other gods. It was uh, somehow being removed, his largeness of heart. Yet, we can say that the heart of Jesus Christ for us is so large that he has a lot uh, a lot, an abundance of mercy. His heart is the largest in the universe. Even though as a man, it was the same size of everybody else's, but in regards to his kindness and his love and his mercy towards us, it is the greatest, the largest heart in the entire universe. It's full of love for us. That said, we should ask God for a large heart like he gave to King Solomon. But with us, we have an extra, well, we have a lot of extra blessings because we have the Holy Spirit of God in us. And so we should be given and we should have a big heart for God and for others, just like these are, in part, the greatest commandments to love God and to love one's neighbor. Of course, I always taught about the first commandment is, uh, the, the most important commandment is knowing the fact that he is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and etc. Love God and love thy neighbor. So big hearted could mean a number of things, such as an open hand to give, a soft heart to love, a comparing excuse me, a caring and compassionate individual, a hospitable person, kind-hearted, amicable or friendly, and unselfish. Well, it's uh, a long distance to get there. And it states that the inward heart, uh, the inward man, is renewed every day or day by day. Therefore, we should be looking for ways to renew our inward man because uh, that is how our heart is renewed to be larger. And if it's not renewed, it's like it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And our inward man will start to stink like feet that haven't been washed. So Jesus started to wash the feet of the disciples. Verse 17 says, For our light affliction which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. In this affliction, the Bible says, is but for a moment, just a moment. And so it's like God saying, hey, your affliction, yeah, you're afflicted, but it's just a moment. And it names it a light affliction. That said, our affliction is that which we can deal with, for it is only for a moment, and the weight of a glory, the light affliction, is really nothing in comparison to that which is eternal. Amen. Look at what comes out of this light affliction for the name of Jesus Christ. A much far exceeding and eternal weight of glory is going to meet us in heaven. Verse number 18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are seen are eternal. Here there is something in the word of God that should be attended to more. Things that are seen are temporal. They're not to be uh, totally fixed our eyesight on. Eh... Therefore, we should attend not to those things that are seen, but we should attend to those things that are not seen as our focus. What is more important, our physical houses and cars or the word of God, the preaching of the truth? Uh, 
What is more important to us, the beauty of our clothes or a sacrificial offering for God's truth to be claimed, proclaimed here and there? What is more important, our look on the outside or how God looks in us? Meaning, worldly way, but yes, we do and prepare it to be presentable according to our godly appearance. Something that is eternal is our soul and where it will it, 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 uh, spend eternity. We need God. He's eternal. He is sp and his spirit is eternal. If we receive him, we will have an eternal inheritance. His word is eternal. We should always look to him in his word for guidance and truth. His word keeps us going. To learn about his truth is to learn from the best book of books that has ever been written for mankind because it is in the pages of those, the word is life eternal. If it is in it is truth, knowledge, wisdom, guidance, and spiritual awakening. In it is what everyone needs. Alleluia for an eternity guidance in it is the way the gospel way the truth of who jesus is the life that one can receive by receiving true forgiveness of sins in the spirit of god amen promise of it thus everything that is seen with our eyes today is temporary the physical houses that we sleep in the cars that we drive the clothes that we wear everything is temporal even our bodies but those things that are eternal are that much more important to us and for us. Thus, the counsel for the church is to focus one's attention on those things that are not seen. The Apostle Paul gives us the reason. Those things that are seen are temporal. Therefore, one takes note that um, in the world, the glamour of window shopping to see the things that businesses have to offer some new things or other things that may have been available for a long time, but maybe those things that are new are shown in the window more than those things that are older. Thus, those things in the windows of businesses for people to see are those things that the business wishes to attract people's attention, to come in, on in, look on in, not just in the window, but in the store. And look at what one person can buy. But Jesus Christ encouraged a church in the New Testament, the Laodicean church in the book of Revelation, to buy something different, to go shopping, not just window shopping, but to go shopping in the, in, in the things of the Spirit. In Revelation chapter 3, 17 to 22, it says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and I have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and was up with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and is set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. It seems that the Laodicean church people were rich, physically speaking, temporarily speaking, and they were not only those who would go window shopping in the world, per se, but they also went in to the store and bought whatever they needed or they wanted. And it was more, it was more than just what they needed. It was also what they wanted. They had more abundance in the temporary realm. They got what they wanted in the physical realm. However, Jesus looked at what they had eternally, the the things that would last forever, and it was lacking immensely, even to the point of they didn't have salvation yet. Jesus looked at what they had eternally. It was lacking immensely. He counseled them to buy white raiment, eye salve, 
gold tried in the fire to be spiritually rich for this gold tried in the fire no doubt is the reception of the holy spirit to receive white raiment is to be baptized in jesus name to anoint one's eyes is to see the spiritual things much easier and better and so they had a problem the problem of the church was that they did not even have salvation, for they had not obeyed yet the message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. It seems that the people in this particular church were attendees, but they were not following the keys to get in heaven as of yet, and Jesus rebuked them. Something was seriously wrong. They needed a change. The one who noticed this was Jesus Christ himself. The Laodicean was the church was focusing then on the things that were temporal, buying those things that were temporal, filling their houses with things that they would never possess eternally. But Jesus counseled them to start searching and seeking the, those things that were eternal so they could become rich in a spiritual light and for eternity. How much greater is it for one to become rich spiritually, become to becoming rich physically or temporarily in the world. The world focuses its attention on the temporal, and those that glamour will pass away. But those who are rich spiritually or eternally, they have much more than exceedingly much more than those that are rich in the temporal realm because those temporal riches will not transfer from this world into the next so if one wants the spiritual and eternal riches one should of course repent and seek baptism in the name of Jesus for that white raiment, the Holy Spirit, gold tried in the fire, and to be able to see in that spiritual realm. For if they don't get into the church, that is, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and filling filling of the Holy Spirit, not be born, how can they see in that new life? So, Jesus was rebuking them and leading them to the proper way to go. That makes a grand difference. It can hardly even be explained. The difference there is in that which is temporal and that which is spiritual. Temporal and eternal. May God bless you today in the name of Jesus.